Today, I'm gonna to be going over a quick overview of the design of reinforced masonry structures. I'm providing you my own summary sheets that I'm gonna go over along with examples and spreadsheet MathCAD calculations that you can use as reference. I'm mostly gonna be going over the mechanics and the procedures and not so much into the theory. If you want to get more into the theory, I am providing you some of the resources that I've used and I'll link those below in the description along with the summary sheets and the examples. I'm doing this because I'm studying for my structural engineering licensing exam in October. So I'm pretty much doing my summary sheets and I might as well share it with you guys. I learned a lot of these things through the course I'm taking right now. I'm taking uh, the structural engineering exam course with AEI. Uh, they are formerly known as EET. So I've taken some of their material and comprehended it in my own words and the way I use things. I've also got a lot from the 2015 uh, design of reinforced masonry structures. Uh, this is probably the best book that you can get if you're looking into practical applications of reinforced masonry. I'm not sure if you can get a hard copy of this online, but I do know it is free, at least the flipbook version of it. It's available online at the Concrete Masonry Association of California and Nevada. Their website is, I believe it's uh, cmacn.org. So if you go there, I'll provide it in the links in the description below, but you should be able to find a free copy there. This is what concrete masonry units look like. They're basically made out of these concrete masonry units and they have reinforcement and they usually fill these up with grout, especially if you're in seismic zones. If we go into a more diagrammatic sketch, uh, this figure is from the 2015 Design of Reinforced Masonry Structures book. You can find it at this website. It should be for free, like I mentioned before. What you basically need to know about uh, CMU is that it's uh, really similar to concrete in terms of mechanics. It's strong in compression, and we usually need reinforcement or tension reinforcement to take any tension. So let's jump into the overall picture. Like I said, I'm gonna be going over through more of the mechanics because this is the study sheet that I've made and this is what I'm going to be using for my SE exam so it really is just getting to the point. I have the, the basic formulas and the basic procedures for beam design, for shear design, and for axial design. So there's not a lot of theory here but this is giving you the procedure so it's really great if you know you're newer to masonry and you just want to do some double checks maybe you're double checking the software that you're inputting things in i provided this summary sheet for you below in the in the links and i've also included uh, some masonry design examples and i go through step by step following the methods in my spread in my summary sheets on on how i get these so this and the summary sheets are available in the description below for download. All right, let's run through flexural design real quick. What's the big picture here? The, the goal is to basically get your actual stress. Uh, this it's denoted by the small f and you just have to make sure that it's less than your capacity. FB is the maximum stress in the masonry and FS is the maximum stress in the steel. You'll get your moments basically from the loading that you're giving that you're given in the problem. And what you basically need to do is find out what the capacities are for FB and FS. And those are actually already given in the code. So per the code, your masonry bending capacity is this equation. Uh, your modulus of elasticity is a function of your specified concrete masonry compressive strength, which is, which is usually given. And depending on your grade of steel, you're gonna have either 32 or 20. So that, that way you already have your FB and your FS. Now what we need to do is try to find uh, these equations right here. And I just outlined a basic procedure. Uh, this is something that I encounter a lot at work. Maybe you're given a beam or a retaining wall. You have the moment on that retaining wall and you need to find out how much steel you're, you need to put into that retaining wall. This is the basic procedure. It's a little more intimidating uh, than it or it's not as intimidating as it looks, what you're basically gonna do is, first you're gonna assume your J and, and your area of steel, and then you're gonna do this row, row, N, K, J routine. What this basically is, this is a, this is basically a big plug and chug, this whole routine right here. You already have all these numbers, you just have to plug it up, 
plug these into the equation and it's kind of just a routine. And where does this all come from? Again, similar to concrete, this is the cross-section strain stress and equilibrium relationships. So if you do the derivations of that, you'll end up uh, coming up with this. And once you have all of these guys, now you have your J here. So then you can end up solving this guy. And if we're looking at the bigger picture, this is what in the beginning we're, we're trying to solve. So now we have all of these numbers and we're just gonna check that the demand is less than the capacity for, uh, for both for masonry bending and for the steel capacity. So you need to check both of these. And I made some notes on some other routines that additional uh, checks that you have to do that has to do with reinforcement or finding the effective span length but I'll leave that up to you to go over by yourself. So how does this actually look like? So let's do a problem. Let's see this procedure in action. So over here we have a, a CMU beam and we're given the loads and we find our moments and we find our shears. Uh, there's no axial load and all these are pretty much given in the problem statement anyway. So you should have all these. So now let's start the procedure. We get We got all these variables. Now we're going to assume that J is equal to 0 0.9. We need to find the area of steel. So we're just going to do an estimate. We know the width of the beam. We know the effective depth and we need approximately this amount. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume two number fives just to meet that required area of steel. And then, then we go into this routine right here, the, the rho rho n k j. You have all these already. So Again, it's just a plug and chug. And then we are gonna do our final uh, stress checks. We have that, that's okay. Then we have the stress in the steel, that's less than the steel capacity. So we are okay to go through that. Now let's jump into shear design. For shear design, it's similar except this is the shear stress and that's the allowable shear that we can have or the capacity of the of the shear section. But one thing to note is that there is a limit on the maximum value that you can have for your, uh, for FV. So I'm gonna call that your FV max. So for how to find FV, that's the equation right there. How to find your big FV, this is the equation right here. This is going to include your VM, your shear capacity of the, the masonry, and your VS is the shear capacity of any steel, uh, shear steel, reinforcement that you have in the section. And the FVM, that's the equation for that one. And your FVS, that's the equation for that one. And the equation for FV max, there's two of them. There's one where you can calculate this M over V uh, depth of the shear member. Or to be conservative, you can just assume that this right here is equal uh, to one. So what I end up doing is usually just just to be conservative and to make the calculations a little easier, just assume that this ratio is equal to one and then you'll end up using this equation. The basic procedure for this is you're going to find your uh, applied stress. You'll find your M over V dV ratio or just assume it to be equal to one. Just make sure that this FV max, you're not going over and then you're gonna check the shear for the masonry. And then if your shear for the masonry is good, you technically don't need any shear reinforcement. If it's not good, then you need to end up adding shear steel. So once you have one or both of these guys, uh, plug it in to get your final FV, and then going back to the overall picture, we're just gonna do the final check on that, which is right here. So let's go back to the example so we can see that in action. So same, Example, same beam example, but now we're gonna design for shear starting here. You have the actual shear depth of the member. You're gonna find your FV right here and assume that this will get you your FV max. Then you're gonna do this masonry check that we talked about. And you're just gonna check if the, the masonry shear strength alone can take it. And in this case, it can. So this way we don't need any shear reinforcement for this example. Now let's jump into axial uh, design. Axial design, the big picture is uh, similarly, you can go in stress or little fa less than big fa or the axial capacity. Uh, but I, for axial, I tend to use uh, p or pa. 
this is basically instead of stress, this is I express this in kips or, or pounds. That's just my preference. You can convert uh, this equation to stress, uh, you know, just take uh, the areas out. The routine here is pretty straightforward. You need to find your H over R value. Basically, this is uh, checking for slenderness, checking to see if it's less than 99. Uh, for a column, it does need to be non-slender. So this is, if you have a column, you need to meet this requirement anyways. If you have a slender wall, you might end up using this equation. And since it all starts off here, H is the effective height. And I just included this for uh, my reference for pin pinned, the effective height is equal to the length. Uh, fixed pin 0.8L. Uh, for a cantilever, it's double the, the length. So that's something to keep in mind. And the R is the least radius of gyration. For you know, a typical solid grouted section, you know, a typical masonry unit, uh, this is, you can simplify that to the thickness of the masonry or the, the least thickness divided by the square root of 12. So that, for example. Just a note here, this equation is for, as you can see here, this is the, the masonry axial capacity. And over here, this is the compression steel capacity. So you might need to split these up just in case you need to solve for the area of steel which we'll be doing in this design example. For the most part, that's the typical equations, the typical procedure for axial design. It's pretty simple. You do have to check all these other different requirements, which is uh, pretty easy, but just tedious at times. But just know that they're there and, and they do need to be checked. But for now, let's go into a quick design example on how this looks like. So over here in the design examples that I provided, there's another shear example where you actually have to design the steel that I've included. But for this axial design example, we'll be designing this axial column. So we're starting off the procedure here. We're finding the H. We find the R. We find out that our H over R is less than 99, so we can go ahead and use this equation. So in this example, they give us a section, but we don't know the, the steel yet, so that's what we need to solve for. So like I mentioned in the summary sheet, we're gonna split this up. This is gonna be, yeah, so let's call this PM. Let's call this PS for the steel, just for example's sake. So in this example, we're gonna solve for the masonry and then we're gonna solve for the area of steel required. So the masonry compressive strength that's available is about 320 kips. We can see from the applied axial load, uh, the masonry is not gonna be enough. So we're going to need to solve for the area of steel. That is just basically the applied load minus the masonry compressive strength. So that's how much leftover load that we need to design the steel for. And this equation is this equation, but now you're just solving for the area of steel required. The design's pretty much done, but you still need to check all these additional requirements. Now let's go into the last portion, the axial and flexural. So now you have a column that has axial force and it also has a bending moment in it. The procedure, you've basically done all these before, they're just a little bit different. So what the basic procedure is, step one, you know, just check the axial forces only without the bending. And then step two, you're gonna combine them and check both for flexural and axial. But for step one, you've already done it. This equation is the same as your original equation, just converted to, to stresses instead of uh, forces. So it's the same thing. We're doing that just because it kind of makes our equations easier once we're checking these. But you've already done this. It's the same H over R, so nothing new there. And for step two, when we need to check the combined flexural, you're gonna have your stresses from the axial and you're gonna have your stresses from uh, bending. And you need to find out if your section is cracked or not. And where does that come from? If you go back to this guy, this is where that equation is coming from. So sometimes you have a lot of axial force in your member that even with the, when there's bending, it's not enough. The, the axial is high enough that it cancels out the tension. In this case, it's blue. So what you end up is you don't technically need any tension steel. The other case is where your bending moment's high enough or you don't have enough axial load and you are going to have tension in your member. So that's when you'll end up needing some tension steel. 
So if you're in this condition, that means it's cracked. If you have no flexural tension, that means your section is uncracked. So this is where this check comes in. So if your FA is greater than FB, use the uncracked section or the uncracked uh, equation. Otherwise, your section is gonna be cracked. So for an uncracked section, you're just gonna combine these stresses and check that it's less than your allowable bending capacity in the masonry. But if it's cracked, you're gonna have to go through this routine. This looks a lot more intimidating than it actually is. It's, again, it's like I, I mentioned here, this is gonna be the, the row row N uh, KJ routine, except the only difference is your K is going to be different and your your moment capacity equations are going to be different. And you've already done this in when you're doing bending. In this routine, it's the same thing, just you can see that your K is going to be different. It's basically a lot, a lot longer equations, but you can simplify it. You can see that if you solve for, for these guys, these are all grouped up. Uh, same thing over here for these equations. You have that in your row end. So once you find these, just uh, plug and chug. One thing to note over here is once you do need to solve for both of these guys, you need to solve for when the, the moment when the compressive stress governs and the moment when uh, tensile uh, steel stress governs. And you need to find out uh, what's the minimum of these values. That's going to be your maximum allowable moment right there. And you already have your M applied and you have this. So that's pretty much the gist of combined axial and flexural design. I have an example of that one also. So let's start off with step one. Let's check that flexor. We found our H and we found our R. Here we go. And it's the same routine for the axial checks. So once you found that, then you go on to step two. In order to find the applied bending stress, uh, you'll need to find your section modulus, which is pretty straightforward. And then you can check your cracked or uncracked section. We've already calculated FA over here. FA is greater than FB, therefore it's going to be a cracked section. So over here, we're going to need to use all these formulas. And you already have all the numbers, so just a, a plug and chug, but just with a lot of equations. Uh, you're going to find the minimum moment, which is going to be your MA, and then you're going to check it against the applied moment. And that's going to be your check for combined axial and flexural design.